Hi everyone. Okay, so this is the PowerPoint on primates. <clears throat> So like I mentioned before, even though this is the cultural class, we do spend a little bit of time on the biological stuff, just to kind of build up some of these, um, like the cultural aspects. We really have to stand the understand the, a lot of the, oh my gosh, we really have to understand the biology behind it. Okay, so um, if you're looking at this PowerPoint, you're like, wow, there's quite a few slides. A lot of these are pictures, so this, I say this every time, like this is gonna be a short lecture. I really think this one's gonna be a short, short lecture. Okay, so the primates, because this is, this is just, Oh my gosh, this is just a general overview. Let's see if I can talk today. Okay, slide two on primates. <clears throat> um, okay, so scientific classification. So most of you are probably familiar with uh, like the fact the fact that humans are we are we are primates. We're apes, um, and so this is just showing you some information about this. So our orders: primates, class Mammalia. Like so, you know we're mammals, right? And just some of the other information. And the picture is really just to kind of highlight that amongst primates there is so much variation from the at least currently existing the very large gorilla to the and i think it's in the picture where is it where is it oh yeah so on the <laughs> on the gibbon in the middle he the gibbon is like you know brachiating um on top of his head is like a little mouse lemur so you can see like this wide range of size for primates and, and different looks and different types of locomotion and and so we're gonna kind of talk about a little bit of that. Okay, so slide three. So a little bit more on the classification. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, we're mostly all familiar with this. We got that like in you know elementary school, junior high, high school, you're getting it again now. I'm not gonna quiz you on that, but just know like that if you take all, of, this is the whole point, you take all of animals and you're like, let's break them down into groups, smaller and smaller and smaller until we eventually get a species. This is what this is, you know. So um, this is for us, we are homo sapiens. And this is the point I want to make. This is called binomial nomenclature. So in, <clears throat> typically we don't refer to a species just by the species name. Usually we refer to it by the genus and the species. So two, the genus and the species name. We'd say homo sapiens. Um, we typically wouldn't say sapiens, homo sapiens. So this is just, versus like, this is in contrast to, um, like that's, so that's a scientific name, but the like common name we'd say humans or like chimpanzees, we might say, Chimpanzees were the common name, but the scientific name would be Pan troglodytes. So there's common name, scientific name, and when you use a scientific name, you're using that two two name binomial nomenclature, genus and species. Okay, so slide four. So primates, talking about primates. <clears throat> what are the traits that we all share? So these are generally true. They're right occasionally be an exception like everything in life like everything in nature there's going to be an exception but these are generally true that for primates so we're talking about some of the physical features on the list so we have grasping hands or opposable thumbs so i can grasp things i can grip and grab so all of my fingers are in line with each other except for my thumb which sticks out to the side it allows me for like doing this you know grabbing things um so if you look at your feet your feet you don't have a divergent digit but like other primates like you know chimpanzees or gorillas their their feet look similar to their hands ours we're, we're the weird one in that our feet and hands look very different um so they often have a very similar like their like their um, big toe would stick out to the side so they can oppose their feet so we can't do that you know you can't really grab stuff with your foot like in the same way like maybe you could grab something small with your toes but you don't have the ability to grip but all primates have this ability this is what allows you see primates like not just humans but a lot of other primates using our hands for stuff making tools um, this allows for that we have an emphasis on vision rather than smell so think about like your dog like if you have a dog if you've been around dogs that dogs that are like sniffing everything that's how they get their social information they're like oh a dog peed here that was a female dog that's a male dog or whatever you know they smell things their sense of smell is something like 700 times more it might even be more than that it's like insane like they know they learn about their environment because with their nose that's why they have what's called a rhinarium they have a wet nose it allows to get all that in <clears throat> for primates not so much more of an emphasis on vision <clears throat> and we know this um the the bony structure around our eyes is much more complex um the nasal structure is not as complex so 
uh, and then like to the next one, enclosed eye orbit. So the bony structure around her eyes is much more close. So like if you're like this, you're like bone, 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 except for obviously in the front. But like go like right now or later to like your dog or your cat and feel, you feel like maybe a little bit of muscle and you're just gonna feel like eyeball. There's no bone like on the side. Most, some other non-primates have it, but many do not because they don't have an emphasis on vision. The body has, you know, moved resources to here in the nose for that function and not so much around the eyes. Um, five digits on the hands and the feet, like this is true for many animals, but just putting that in there. Nails rather than claws. So look at the picture of the chimpanzee hand. So it's very, sim very similar to a human hand. They um, have nails, they don't have claws. So, so like, go look at your dog or your cat's, you know, paw, like, oh, nails, they don't have, or claws, they don't have nails the way primates do, we all have nails. And then reduction of the snout. So this is called, I might have this on a later slide, but I'll just put it down. You know, I, I like to use my whiteboard when I can. Okay. So when we see that projection of the snout, this is called prognathism. 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 So we could say that animal is very prognathic. Like they have, like some dogs, they have tend to have Maybe like a few exceptions, like pugs or something, but most dogs tend to have a more of a snout. Most animals tend to have kind of a snout. We call that prognathic. They have that. It's projecting out. Primates in general, compared to non-primates, we tend to see a reduction in that. And humans are kind of like the extreme, like our faces are essentially flat. We don't have like any kind of snout either in our mouth or our nose really at all. Um, and as we look at you know, primates, we're going to see some variation of that. Some having a little bit more, some having a little less. But in general, as primates compared to non-primates, we tend to not have as much. Slide five. <clears throat> some more, uh, some behavioral traits that all primates have in common, usually single offspring. So if you think of a human, this is true, we typically see one at a time. We call it singleton. Sometimes on occasion you will see twins or like multiples, but that's like not the norm. That's rare. This is true for all primates. Um, extended juvenile periods. So think about like for a human. At what age are we like able to reproduce? Not considering like social or cultural rules because we might say like, oh, wait till you're 18 or something. But biologically, Let's see, for the average female, she's gonna start her, she's gonna start menstruating at around 12. It takes about a year to have your first ovulation, so let's say 13. So let's just say, we'll say even 14. Let's say age 14, it's 14 years until our species is able to reproduce. Um, there's an extended period like of them being children, we call them children for humans, um, but for other primates, they tend to have this long, it, it, it'll be, it won't be as long as 14 years. For humans, it's a little longer. Um, but for most primates, this is true. Like chimpanzees, I think that theirs is like eight, eight years is when they're reproductively, I could be wrong, eight years? I feel like that's right. Uh, and for most other apes, it's a long period of time because there's a whole long period of time for them to have to learn stuff. Um, this is in contrast to think about like your dog. Like when can they start reproducing their own, you know, offspring? Less than a year, right? Like a year, probably less. Um, well, and you think about it, well, their lives are shorter. They might live, you know, depending on the dog, type of dog breed, you know, 10 years, 15 years. So that makes a little more sense, but, but it's still, it's still short, in, you know, when you're thinking about it in terms of like, we still have a, a an extended period of, of learning um, and like, the, the, the amount of time, like not just like the to reproduction, but everything else is kind of extended. Like how long would it take a human until they can start walking? I don't even, I don't have children. So I like a year and a half. It's a long time, right? A year? I don't even know. It's not like a month, right? It's a long time versus like when can, you know, dogs start walking on their own? When can like horses stop, start walking on their own? Like very quickly, very within hours to days, right? Um, so the so the process for us and for other primates is, is we're much more dependent as as young offspring, um, in multiple ways. You know, behaviorally for food, um, in multiple ways. And 
Oh yes, I already put that. So dependence on learned behavior. So there's a period where we have to learn a lot of information. So we call this culture. So for humans, we tend to like we tend to forget that other animals have this, other primates especially, that they have this extended period where they have to have time to learn information. That's not innate or natural. Doesn't come natural. It's not instinctual. They have to learn information that they have to be taught by typically like the mother, but off, but sometimes maybe the mother and the father, depending on the species. And then of course, strong mother infant bond. This is probably true for most mammals because there's literally like a physical bond after like well there's gestation but then after birth with breastfeeding there's a physical bond because of that and um, what we tend to see in in mammals obviously but primates um, that um, females tend to be the one who do the most of the caregiving so males tend to not be as involved now you might say well that might be true in terms of nature but humans as a group that's not true males you know it's 50 50 that might be true on occasion, and you might know, this is absolutely true, you might know someone who it's the, it's the father taking, doing all of the caregiving, and a mother who doesn't at all. Exceptions obviously are going to happen, that is absolutely true. The general norm is not that. What we see is the females from culture to culture tend to be the ones who do the majority of the caregiving. Um, so just keep that in mind. So just like other primates, we're like that. Okay, so slide six primate taxonomy um so like i said before we're the order of primates and I, i'm not expecting i'm not gonna be like what's the suborder of prim like i'm not gonna ask you that type of question don't think to memorize like those little terms just understand these larger conceptual ideas um so we have the order of primates but obviously we're, we're we can be split off into smaller groups after that so we have suborders um strepsorines and haplorines <clears throat> Um, I'm sorry, I was like blank for a second. So we have in one group the lemurs and the lorises, and then the other group basically everything else. So that includes new world monkeys, old world monkeys, tarsiers, apes, and that includes humans. So some of these terms you might be thinking, I don't even know what's a tarsier, what's the difference between a new world and an old world monkey? Wait, I'm an ape? Like, so I'm gonna explain all this right now. So I've put here apes and in parentheses humans just to make sure you understand we're in that group. But human, we are apes, we are an ape, and we're a primate. So we're in that group, but I just, for clarification. So now I have a lot of pictures to show you. Slide seven, so here we have the lemurs and the lorises. Go to slide eight. So you'll see, this is just a few. We have uh, that little, um, uh, the mouse lemur, that person's finger so tiny. Um, Ring-tailed lemur, most of you are probably familiar with lemurs. Um, we've got like some lorises, the slow loris, and the rough lemur. So these all tend to be smaller, um, very small to maybe the size of a house cat, so they don't tend to be very big at all. Most of them tend to be nocturnal, and um, they tend to be insectivores. They tend to eat a combination of insects and like plants. Slide nine, you'll see some more pictures. And I, I realized, I realized this earlier, and I just didn't change it. That I have that that picture of that little tiny um, mouse lemur like on two slides. So I'm, I'm like, apparently, I really like that photo because it's just so cute. Um, but also I worry like what if that person's hurting him? He's so tiny. But then we have um, um, another, there's a loris and then the red rough lemur. So you get an idea of what these, these lemurs look like. Okay, so now, like I said before, you might be thinking, what's a tarsier? This is a tarsier, slide 11. So very small, um, like, you know, could fit like in the palm of your hand they are the only primate whose diet is 100 percent animal and by that i mean insects and they will on occasion i think eat like small like lizards and stuff they almost never eat plants uh, it's very rare and they're the only primate that we can say that about because almost all other primates eat plants the majority of the time and only a few like as far as I'm aware, only three primate species will eat, um, no wait, two, wait, okay, we'll get to that in a minute, because I don't want to say the wrong thing, we'll get, I think I have it on the slide, I don't want to miss, miss, uh, say the wrong, say the wrong number, okay, anyway, so, but, but Charsus are the, are the ones we know for sure, are the only ones who have a 100%, like, a 100% for the most part, um, diet of, of only other animals and by that I include insects 
So you can see they have very large eyes. Go to slide 12, you'll see this. In fact, they have the largest eye to head ratio of any animal. Their eyes are so big. Um, I should have put a picture of their skull. Their eyes are so big that they cannot, like if you were like, look over there, you could be like this, right? You can look, like in your, you can move your eyeball in its socket and look, you don't have to turn your whole head. Their eyes are so big that they can't do that. They have to like always be turning their head. Like they can't, they can't do, you know, they can't do that really. Um, because their eyes are just massive. They're nocturnal and this is like, real, like vision is very important to them to be able to see at night. I'm gonna be thinking, on slide 12, like it looks so weird, look at its fingers. Um, there's actually this really good documentary um, that I used to show to students, and this semester I think I'm gonna show you another one, um, not this one, but I used to show it to my students. It's called like, like The Littlest Alien or something. It's not like YouTube, but it's about tarsiers. Tar it's really cute, it talks about them. Um, most people don't realize like that's a primate. In fact, it's more closely related to us than lemurs are. Okay, slide 13, New World. New World monkeys. New World means monkeys who are native to North and South America. And for the most part, what we're gonna see is they're gonna be in Central and South America. So here we have some more pictures. Like I said, a lot of pictures on this. I just wanted you to get a very general idea of primates. So slide 14, you'll see we've got the, that's the capuchin, a howler monkey, and uh, a marmoset. And then slide 15, we've got a spider monkey, the oh, so emperor, so aptly named, emperor tamarind, and a, a saki. Oh, doesn't that saki looks a little mad? But <laughs> so these animal, these new world monkeys tend to be a little more small, like you know, small look can fit in your hand to maybe a little more moderate size. Think about this that. The majority of their environment is covered in trees. It's going to be much more beneficial to be smaller when you live in the trees. You can move more quickly. You will not break any branch underneath you and fall to your death. So being smaller is going to be much more adaptive. Um, and then you'll see here with this picture of that spider monkey, that tail, we call that a prehensile tail. It's not like in the cartoons where they're using it to like pick up stuff. It like, but they often use it like this, they'll use it for extra balance, like a fifth limb. Especially you'll see this often, they'll use it to balance and then they're maybe they're using their hand to grab at some fruit or something. So it allows them because obviously having balance is gonna be much more adaptive in the trees than like being on the ground. That they tend to have longer tails and they tend to be able to use them like this as like a, an extra way to balance. Okay, so now we've got slide 16, the old world monkeys. So these are um, monkeys who are native to Africa and Asia. So we've got slide 17, uh, a baboon, a colobus monkey, and a mandrel, one of my favorites. So beautiful, that's the male. So the male is the one with all the coloring. The females do not have that same coloring. They get to choose, you know, sexual selection. They're choosing which male um, they want, um, you know, the females would be like, oh, I really like that, you know, bright blue. And we, we might laugh at that, but we do the same thing. I might like that uh, scruffy beard, you know. There, there are going to be very particular reasons why. And in fact, we know with the coloring that what it ends up indicating is, like, the brighter the color tends to be a signal of, like, health and stuff like that. Um, slide 18. So we've got the uh, macaque. The, those three, right, those three, like, infants, um, or sometimes called snow monkeys, so those, those are the ones who live, like, in those hot springs, like, in Japan. Um, proboscis monkey, that's the one with the weird-looking nose, proboscis monkey. The red colobus, and I've got one on here I can't quite remember. This black one's very interesting. Um, I have to think about that one for a second, but with that interesting, like, coloring on the, on the face. So you can see... For old world monkeys, they tend to be a little bit more medium sized. So think of like a baboon, it tends to be very strong, but in their size it tends to be more medium. They're on the ground, or they tend to be terrestrial. So that means on the ground. And of course they can be a little bigger because of that. It's gonna be very beneficial to them in terms of like maybe being a little bigger for males fighting other males, sexual selection. Okay, slide 19, the apes. And for the other ones, I'm going to tell you, I only gave you just a few examples. There are many, many more. For apes, though, 
I can literally put them all on these. I put them on one slide, but I split it up into two slides because there are so few ape species that are existing, currently existing, extant. Um, so here we have slide 20. <clears throat> we have a human and a chimpanzee in the same photo. Um, then we have an orangutan. And then we have on the far right, there's the bonobo. So you'll see, sometimes you'll hear bonobos referred to as pygmy chimpanzees. They look very similar to a chimp, but genetically they're, they are different. Um, they are a whole different species. Um, and in fact, like there's a lot of really interesting research on bonobos um, in terms of like their social structure. It's quite different from the, the chimpanzees. <clears throat> so chimpanzees tend to be like, they tend to be more aggressive, males and females, and bonobos are not. The, in chimpanzee, uh, the social hierarchy, the males are um, the ones in charge, and for bonobos, the females are not, or the females are the ones in charge. And as you can imagine, that ends up translating to bonobos tend to be more peaceful in general as a group. There tends to be less fighting. Um, yeah. And then slide 21, you'll see a gorilla and a gibbon. So gibbon, some people will mistakenly say, oh, that's a monkey, a gibbon is not a monkey. Do you know how to tell the difference between an ape and a monkey? Tail or no tail, it's that easy. So if you're looking at a primate, like, okay, I know it's a primate, but is it an ape or a monkey? When you look at the gibbon, it does not have a tail, it's an ape. It's smaller, because the other apes, we all tend to be a little bit bigger, but gibbons are a bit more like medium size. Uh, but it is an ape. Okay, so slide 22. Primate locomotion. So for primates, there are four types of locomotion. And I, do I have a slide for this one? Okay, no. Um, like I said, this is just like the quick and dirty version of this. Um, okay, so slide 22, uh, primate locomotion. So there are four types, quadrupedalism, bipedalism, brachiation slash suspension and vertical clinging and leaping, or VCL for short. So they're all pictured right here. So here we have the lemur quadrupedal, so all fours quad on all fours quadrupedal. There we have the human as a biped. We are bipedal, we walk on two limbs, or our hind limbs. Then we have the gibbon brachiating. <clears throat> so brachi the difference between brachiation and suspension typically is brachiating is like more of a faster movement. Um, suspension is like hanging, so like orangutans are suspenders, they will hang, they'll move, but they tend to do it slower and they tend to do a lot of hanging um, in the trees. Um, and versus a gibbon, because it's a little more medium sized, can swing. In fact, if you Google like, you know, gibbon swinging, they're like psh, psh, it's so fast, like so fast. And just, it's, in fact, when you think about when you were a kid, like on the monkey bars, incorrectly named because no monkeys do that, it's like, you should be called like the ape bars. But when you like thought about when you're on those, you know, you have one hand, both hands are on a bar and then you release and you grab onto the next one and then you release. Well, gibbons, they do it so efficiently and so quickly that there will be times when neither hand is on a branch. They have already left, like they're, they're on their way and this hand is off and they're hoping to reach something with this, I don't know if you can see my hand. They're, they can hope to reach something like, because they're doing it so quickly. It's really, really beautiful to watch. And then we have over here a lemur who's a vertical clinger and leaper. So these animals, they will have their hind limbs or their legs will be longer because they use them to like um, push off. And that's what they do. They Just like it sounds, they, they cling, they leap and cling, leap and cling to trees. And that's how they move about in the world. And if they reach an area where there is, there are no trees, like an opening, they don't just suddenly start walking quadrupedally or suddenly start walking bipedally. They still do that same motion, but on the ground. So you'll see it looks like they're skipping because they're like, they're leaping, they're leaping, they're leaping. That's what they're doing. Okay. Slide 23. So for primate diet, if you want to know what a primate is eating, what the majority of their diet is, you need to look at the back teeth. So the molars in the back are right a little bit more anterior to that, the premolars, mostly the molars. You want to know what a primate is eating, you need to look at the molars, the back teeth. There are, the book might give you more, like sometimes they give you four or five, but I'm just gonna talk about these three very briefly, these three general diets for primates, insectivore, frugivore, and folivore. So insectivore, just like it sounds in the name, those are <clears throat> species who the majority of their diet is in, are insects. 
Um, they most insectivores will also eat the occasional fruit or plant of some sort, but insects makes up the majority of their diet. So their teeth are adapted to that. They tend to be um, sharper cusps. So by a cusp, I mean like if you feel on your teeth, you're like, oh, you, it probably feels like kind of smooth and rounded. Um, that part on the top of your teeth where it's like poking up where it's going to like, you know, touch the food um, or touch the teeth on the other side of it. Um, for insectivores, they tend to be very sharp and this is for like breaking apart like insect parts and stuff and, you know, shearing them. And um, Contrast the frugivore diet. So this is a diet where the majority of it is mostly fruit. Um, frugivores will sometimes eat other plants plants it's not just fruit but fruit makes up the majority of their diet so they don't really need these sharp cusps on their teeth because they're eating like imagine if you were eating like mangoes all the time you know you don't really need anything sharp to like to eat that fruit right um not even really to open up the open up the fruit you don't really need it um but definitely for like the chewing part which you do in the back of your mouth you you know small or i should say uh, rounded cusps like those in your mouth uh, as a human, frugivore humans would be are considered like classic frugivores. It's because it's old, because evolutionarily that's been true. It's only recently that that has shifted. Um, so if you look at our teeth, because we have been adapted for you know millions of years, you're like that's a frugivore. In fact, our teeth look almost exactly the same as a chimpanzee. I think I have a picture of it in a minute. But okay, um, and then folivore. So these are animals, uh, species who the majority of their diet is. Um, plants and leaves imagine like leaves or stems or bark so um, the gorilla is a really good example of this they are classic folivores they can you know they'll peel the bark off a tree and eat it and so like when you see a gorilla you see that like a really big gut that's not fat it's they're they're literally their intestines they're so long it has to kind of fit in that belly that's what you're seeing it's because they're folivores they can get nutrients out of that food it just takes the body a lot longer to suck up the nutrients you're gonna get it's gonna be much easier and faster for your body to get nutrients out of a you know a soft mango than it's gonna be from bark from a tree. It can it can happen, but it's gonna take the body longer. So that's why you see like in gorillas, that's what they're eating, um, that their gut systems like that. And you might be thinking, well, why would they choose to eat that? But think of it adaptively, like everyone's eating the fruit because it's delicious. Let's you know eat this bark. No one else is eating it, so now we have now we have you know this available resource that's. For us, it's not the best, but it's available. Don't have to fight over it. Um, so this is what we see like evolutionarily happening. Okay. Slide 24, I'm just checking the time. Okay. Slide 24. Obviously this is important. There's a star. The font is giant. It's in bold. Large canine teeth among primates are not indicative of meat eating. Large canine teeth among primates are not indicative of meat eating. Like I said, if you want to know what a primate is eating, you have to look in the back teeth. Canine teeth in non-primates absolutely can have something to do with what they're eating. But in primates, that's not true. Canine teeth in primates has nothing to do with food. If you want to know what they're eating, you need to look at the back teeth. Canines in primates, the size has nothing to do with whether they're eating meat. And I have some examples of this. So look on slide 25. Here we have a folivore. So that's an animal who's eating mostly plants, leaves, stems, bark, sometimes the occasional fruit, maybe even the occasional insect, but full of board, like their teeth are adapted to eating mostly those plants. So here we have the mandrill again, but look at those canines. They are massive. They are not for food. And look at that second picture. This is the point is for primates, canine teeth have everything to do with sexual selection and not food at all. Those teeth are intimidating and scary, and in a fight, which he as a male will definitely be in with other males, they are gonna be used as a weapon. That's what they're for. And females will often select as potential mates um, the one with like the sharpest or the biggest canines. 26, here we go again. Chimpanzee, classic frugivore. The majority of their diet is mostly fruit, a lot of fresh fruit. Chimpanzees definitely eat insects too. Um, but there's their molars like it's clearly they are clearly like I said frugivores that's the majority of their diet but look at those large canines it has nothing to do with what they're eating it's for sexual selection because their males are often competing with other males for access to the females as part of sexual selection 
another example, slide 27. Um, the gorilla, classic foldivore. Like I said, gorillas, you know, they'll, they'll eat all the bark off a, off a tree. They're eating the plant. Um, they will eat the occasional insect. Um, they do not eat meat. I don't know why people, I've had someone says, well, gorillas eat meat. No, they do not. <laughs> Those teeth are not for meat. Those teeth are for scaring off other males. And in fact, like for gorillas, they have uh, like a harem system. One male will get access to like four or five females and other males will get access to none. So the amount of competition from male to male evolutionarily and re reproductively is extreme because it's not as if the loser in a fight gets like one female and the winner gets like four. No, it's all or nothing. So you see these males are so much bigger, larger, and this is why. Um, they are larger and bigger because, and these large canines for, for intimidation and or actual fighting because of access to, to the females. In primates, this is why we see those large canines. They don't have anything to do with the food. They have everything to do with sexual selection. And then slide 28. So just as, you know, another example. So humans, hopefully you recognize that from the picture. So we are a classic frugivore. However, we recently in the last, you know, Maybe like two million or less years, uh, three million, uh, a few. Let's just say a few million. Um, have had meat, at, well, at least like consistently, um, in our diet. And by consistently, I mean like evolutionarily, like maybe animal meat once a week or something like that. Um, but consistent enough for sure, it compared to like what it was before, which is none. Um, so we, even if you're like, okay, let's just say that's true, we're an omnivore, let's say that's the argument, but look at our teeth, like, where's the canine? It's not even there, right? Um, in fact, this is true for most humans, like, our, our, essentially, our canine has become, like, an extra incisor. So these teeth in the front are kind of incisors, it's basically come like a, become like an extra incisor. It barely hangs below what we call the occlusal plane, so like where the teeth meet, it barely hangs below that line. Like sometimes you see people, when you see people with a kind of an extra large canine, it's it really stands out, right? But if you look at like that compared to a chimpanzee, it's like nothing. Like especially this picture, which is like a standard like mouth, teeth of a, of a human, you're barely like, which one is it? Oh, I can use to count, like you can't even really tell. Um, so it has nothing to do, so the canine size has nothing to do with meat eating. Slide 29, so this is, so this is a juvenile chimp, so the, the canine is um, reduced because it's still like, you know, not um, reproductive age yet. But I just wanted to show you because the mouth is open, you could see those back teeth. Those back teeth, so like I said here, chip molars, very similar to human molars, both would be classified as frugivores. So their molars are extremely similar to, to humans because humans evolutionarily, this is what we ate, so what our back teeth are adapted for, for, for fruit and other plant items. So those round, um, low cusps on those back teeth. And I already kind of answered the question, but we're gonna talk about it in a little more detail. So slide 30, why do many primate species have such large canines then? And you can see here from this picture, you're like, that's not, you know. <laughs> and uh, in other, in non-primates, obviously the that tooth is, uh, the canine tooth, the size of it's going to have to do with meat eating, um, but not for primates. And so slide 31, like I already kind of answered, but I'll, in more detail, this idea of sexual dimorphism, and I know I mentioned this to you before, but I'll mention it again, it's gonna come up a lot in this class. Sexual dimorphism, the difference between males and females of the same species based on either size, shape, or color. Um, so you can see like a big difference between, if they are, if you have a species who is sexually dimorphic, you might see the female small and the males very large, like a gorilla is a very good example of that. You might see some major color differences, like birds are really good examples. The males tend to be the ones with a lot of coloring, the females tend to be a little more like plain in their coloring, because the females are using that as an indicator of like things like health and stuff. Um, the brightness of the color, for example. So it's, it's important in terms of selecting sexual selection. And, um, um, oh yeah, so you might see um, this being extreme, like a gorilla is a really good example. The male gorilla is around 400 pounds on average and a female gorilla is around like two to 250. So males are like literally twice the size. Um, that's an extreme example, but then you have examples like humans or chimpanzees where we call it slight dimorphism. You can absolutely tell the difference between males and females um, based on multiple things, but it's not going to be quite as extreme as like a gorilla. It's not as extreme. And then you have species where there is no sexual dimorphism. 
what we call monomorphic. You cannot tell the difference between the male and the female of that species unless you literally look at their genitalia. You cannot tell. So a gibbon is a really good example of that. You see it in that picture. Two gibbons. Unless you look at their genitalia, you will not be able to tell which one's a male and which one's a female. It's not, does it map on to size or color? Some gibbons will be a little smaller or a little bigger just because of variation. Some will be a different color just because of variation. Um, like, for example, like dogs are a really good example of this. You cannot tell the sex of a dog unless you look at their genitalia, right? Because it's not as if like all black dogs are female and all orange dogs are male or all really big dogs are male and all really tiny dogs are female. That's not how it works, right? You have to look, you don't know. Um, so what we end up seeing is for primates that this level of either no dimorphism, some dimorphism, or a lot of dimorphism kind of maps onto social um, situations as well. So slide 32. So there are four social structures here. Um, solitary, um, so here the uh, lor uh, lorises and tarsiers are a good example of this. They tend to be, it tends to be one adult female and then her independent offspring. The male usually will come together with the female at certain times for like mating, but then they don't, they're not involved in anything after that. Then we have monogamy. So that's one adult male, one adult female, and then any offspring that they might have. So gibbons are a really good example of this. They tend to have more of a like long-term or lifelong monogamy. So that's very rare in primates. Slide 33, polyandry and polygyny. So polyandry is when you have one male and multiple females. So it's a little more rare, but we see it. We see it in some human populations and we definitely see it in other uh, primates. So it's common among tamarins and marmosets. <clears throat> and then we have polygyny, which is more common. So one male, um, and uh, multiple females. Sometimes you'll see like multi-male, multi-female groups that happens on occasion, like chimpanzees are like that. But um, gorillas are a really good example of polygyny where it's one male, multiple females, and the other eight males just don't get access to those females in any way. And what hopefully you notice, if you go back to slide 31, is that these things map on to this, these levels of dimorphism. So, what we tend to see is groups who are monomorphic, so you can't tell based on size, they tend to be monogamous. Groups that are highly dimorphic, like the gorilla, for example, a lot of competition from, between males for access to females when they are highly dim sexually dimorphic like that. The competition is strong, they tend to not be monogamous in any way. And then you have a handful of species who are somewhere in between in terms of their level of sexual dimorphism, like a human, or a chimpanzee where you can tell it's clear, but it's not as extreme as like a gorilla. And what we tend to see in those species is they tend to not be naturally monogamous. They tend to kind of be somewhere in between. And so this is kind of the point of this one I wanna make is, do you think, um, based on this, like what is your, uh, I mean, I know the answer, but I'll just ask you like, just as a question to think about, are humans naturally monogamous given what we understand about sexual dimorphism mapping onto these things. Like when you see a, pop, uh, a species, oh, I'm gonna sneeze. Okay, maybe not. When you see a species, <coughs> oh, I knew it was coming, okay. When you see a species that's highly dimorphic, that implies extreme competition, moderate to extreme competition between the males of that species for access to the females. It implies that they're not in a monogamous, um, social structure. So when you have a species like a human where we're somewhere in between, we're dimorphic, we're not as extremely dimorphic as a, as a gorilla, but we're definitely dimorphic. What does that imply about who we are socially? And this is quite, so I'll just, like I always think about it, but I know the answer, that humans are not naturally monogamous. Now, you as an individual in the world might feel like that is the right thing for you, totally fine. Um, for personal re re reasons, for religious reasons, absolutely. And most people, most cultures would find that to be the standard. No problem with that. Um, and this is what I, why I'm saying like we're bringing this in because when you have to think about a lot of the cultural implications, but also the evolutionary and biological ones as well, how these, how these things are often related. Um, that we can say naturally, instinctually, we are not monogamous. Um, culturally and socially, we have this as a standard and then 
what is the consequence of that, you know, uh, conflict. Humans are really good at what we call serial monogamy. We're really good at being, I'm so, I apologize if I, I mentioned this to your class already. I feel like I might have mentioned this in another PowerPoint, but maybe not. Okay, humans are really good at serial monogamy. We um, are really good at being monogamous with one person, you know, you're not cheating on them, they're not cheating on you, you're with that person, you're faithful to that person. For, but for a brief period, like say you're with someone, you're monogamous for like two years and then it doesn't work out and you move on to another monogamous relationship. That one doesn't work out and then you move on to another monogamous relationship. We're really good at that. And in fact, there's some studies on this, like looking at it from an evolutionary perspective about what that means. And the average apparently is about four to five years for these like serial monogamous relationships, which makes sense evolutionarily because when you look at humans and we talked about this just a minute ago with the extended juvenile period, at what point would you, um, as a male or a female in the species, typically male, but sometimes as a female in the species, at what point would you say, this isn't working and we're gonna end this partnership and um, I might or might not have access to my offspring anymore in terms of provi providing resources. I wanna secure my genes in the next generation, but I might not be around. At what point would you say, okay, I'm probably sure it's gonna be okay even if, even if I'm not around. You think about for a human, at what age would you say, that a human child probably, like if they were being taught from, from birth, would they know how to access water? What food, like in nature, what acts, what foods were probably poisonous? Which ones were okay to eat? Could, could walk around by themselves. Like about a five, five years old, right? Would be about the minimum age. So like when we think of law, like serial monogamous relationships being on average about five years, this makes sense. So it's just something to think about in terms of, like I said, you know, the cultural and evolutionary you know, influences on, on, on us and stuff. Okay. So that's it. Um, I'll see you guys in the next one.